The Grazadillo School of Business and Management at Pepperdine University proudly presents the Dean's Executive Leadership Series. This podcast invites top business practitioners and thought leaders to share their view on the real world of business. Well, good evening and welcome to the Dean's Executive Leadership Series sponsored by Farmers Insurance. It is my honor to be here once again. My name is Faye McClure. I am the Vice President of Strategic Marketing for Farmers Insurance, where we have been the very proud sponsor of the Dean's Executive Series for the past eight years. Over that time, we've seen amazing speakers uh, through the Dells, and tonight promises to be no exception. At this time, it's my distinct honor to introduce an individual who's celebrating her 10th year as the head of the Grazia Deal School. She is a role model, she is a friend, she is a leader. She is an individual that under her tenure at the Grazia Deal School, she has led the school to prominence as, and is recognized as one of the top business schools in the country. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome the Dean, my dearest, dearest friend, Dr. Linda Livingstone. Well, Faye, thank you. That was a very generous introduction. And uh, Faye McClure, we so appreciate her friendship and the friendship of farmers uh, and their generous support of this program and some of our other programs. So thank you for being here and for continuing to support what we're doing at Pepperdine. So, well, it is just a pleasure to have you back for our second Dells of the uh, academic year and the first of 2012. I know you have uh, a lot of uh, interesting things in store for you tonight. It's going to be a fabulous evening. I want to update you on a couple of things going on in the school before we move on to our speaker. Uh, first, I think most of you are familiar with our Pepperdine Private Capital Markets Project. Uh, this is a project we started about three years ago that really looks at what's happening uh, with private companies and particularly their access to capital. Dr. John Paglia is the leader of that project. We have just signed an agreement with Dun & Bradstreet Credibility Corporation, uh, and we will have access on a monthly, base, ba uh, monthly basis to three million business owners that are in their database. And because of that wonderful access, we are going to start doing a monthly capital access survey, and from that we will develop a monthly index that we think is going to be really influential in that space in the market. And then in addition, we're going to do a semi-annual forecast. Uh, the last forecast that we did, which was the first one we piloted with Dun & Bradstreet, and the data we gained from those business owners actually helped us uh, develop some predictions about some key economic indicators around GDP and inflation and unemployment. And actually, our predictions last year uh, compared to actuals were more accurate than the predictions of the federal government and the Wall Street Journal and several others. So we're really very excited about uh, what's in store for us as we grow that survey and as we partner with Dun & Bradstreet Credibility Corporation. So we will be uh, rolling out that next economic forecast, I think, within the next week. So pay attention to that and look for it. And we hope it's very helpful to you and your organizations, uh, and we look forward to growing and developing that even further. <clears throat> you will notice on your seats that there are two lovely brochures, um, and these promote a couple of our executive education programs that are in the sustain sustainability and corporate social responsibility space. Uh, the green one is actually about a um, uh, executive education program that we're doing on our Malibu campus, led by Dr. Michael Crook. Uh, and if any, how many of you have taken Dr. Crook's class in Malibu in the SEER program? Do we have anybody in the room that's done that? Well, if you haven't and you're in the full-time program, you should do that. It's an amazing program, an amazing class. And uh, Dr. Crook is just recognized around the country for his leadership in this area. So we have this uh, executive education program that will be taking place um, in uh, March. So look forward to this. We hope you'll sign up, encourage other people to do that. And then the other one is actually a pilot program for us. We have not done this before. This is actually an executive education international trip. Many of you did international trips while you were in our degree programs. And this is one on sustainable business strategy in Japan. And this will be led by Tetsuya O'Hara, who is an alum of our executive MBA program. He works at Patagonia. He is a good friend and colleague of Dr. Crooks. And so if you have interest in April in doing an international trip to Japan, I encourage you to take advantage of that. It will be an amazing experience. 
finally, our upcoming uh, Dean's Executive Leadership Series. We have uh, two coming up within the next couple of months. On February 16th, we will have Blake Irving with us uh, here in Santa Monica at the Lowe's Hotel. He is the Chief Product Officer at Yahoo. That will be fascinating, giving all of the change that's been going on at Yahoo, and we'll learn a lot about that. Blake is actually a graduate of one of our programs and was uh, a faculty member for us for a while after he left Microsoft and before he went to Yahoo. So that will be a great evening for us. And then we change gears just a little bit. And on March 15th in Malibu, we will have uh, NBA great Jerry West with us. Uh, he joined us last year, uh, sort of uh, ad hoc for our, uh, when Paul Hopkins joined us. So that's going to be a fascinating evening in March. So we hope you'll join us in Malibu for that. Well, we are here tonight uh, to hear from Jerry Wilson. And Jerry, who is the Senior Vice President of the Coca-Cola Company and Chief Customer and Commercial Officer, has an amazing background. But as we all know, Coca-Cola is one of the most iconic companies you could think about in the United States and around the world. It was actually incorporated as a company in 1892, has 500 brands in over 200 countries, 1.7 billion servings every day. That's pretty impressive. Uh, Jerry uh, is really focuses a lot on people development at Coca-Cola. He also works on enhancing their strategic alliances with all customers globally through consumer and commercial leadership. He is a part of their senior leadership team. Uh, and he's, you, I think you're just going to be really impressed with what you learn from him, not only about the company, but about leadership and just his perspective on what it takes to be successful in the global economy today. So I hope that you will join me in welcoming Jerry Wilson. Well, thank you very much, Dean Livingstone, and good evening. Uh, Happy New Year to all of you. It's great to be here. Mike Sims, thanks for uh, such a warm um, welcome. And I must say a big hello to our most proud and successful alumni, uh, Professor Doreen Shanahan. So um, I want to say it's so great, great to see you again. Doreen and I worked together many years ago back in the 20th century. So um, it's good to reconnect. Uh, over the next few minutes, I am very uh, excited to share with you a few thoughts about our company, about our 2020 vision, how excited we are about the 2020 vision, uh, a little bit about our business plan that's in place, uh, a little bit about branding, a little bit about maybe how you could think about branding yourself, and hopefully over the next few minutes, you'll take away a few ideas that might be useful to yourself. So I must start by saying... Uh, Buona sera, grazie Dio, School of Business and Management here at Pepperdine. Uh, it's so good to be back here. I spent uh, three of my best years in the company uh, based in Irvine, uh, where I had the pleasure of working with Doreen to uh, oversee the 18 western states in our food service and hospitality business, where we served over 125,000 customers every day. And it was a great experience. I learned a lot about entrepreneurship, about leadership, about competition, uh, and the uh, intriguing market that California really drives worldwide. So it's a terrific opportunity. I want to thank you for, for the opportunity to be there, be here. This is a day in the life of Jerry Wilson in an emerging market. Uh, this is, uh, these are some photographs from uh, my uh, recent trip to Africa where I spent time not only with one of our uh, micro distribution center leaders, but also with one of our route people, uh, with one of our customers. And the headline here is that uh, Coca-Cola is committed to building um, what we're calling five by 20. Five million empowered women around the world by 2020, leveraging our entire value chain to help empower women, to pull them out of poverty in emerging markets, to help them take on uh, enterprising opportunities and to grow our business at the same time. This particular market, this is the owner of a business that is a micro distributor uh, in, in Africa that services 200 customers that we could not get to with our normal distribution channel. So our bottling partner works with this woman to bring the right kind of uh, packages, 
the right kind of business management, customer management, to allow us to get a 200 milliliter returnable glass bottle in this man's business. Uh, it's the part of my job that I love the most, being with customers. That same day, in the same city, in a, uh, a modern trade customer, you can see the developing trade, uh, the organized trade that's happening in uh, quick growing countries all around the world. And the key here is to not only execute our commercial priorities, but to build mutually beneficial growth agendas between our customers and our company. And I'll talk a little bit more about that over the next few, few minutes. Now, collaborating for value is not just about being friends with people. And I know collaboration is one of the values of, of this, this program, of what Linda is leading here. But we see collaboration as building a foundation which is based on basic types of transactional areas that will then grow into a collaboration where we're actually connecting our business needs. And our intent is to have as many strategic partners as we can. And a strategic partnership with our customers is where we have a shared agenda. We're actually working on uh, co-developed ideas. It's a multifunctional relationship well beyond sales and transactions. And that's an important thing to think about in today's marketplace is how we or your business is collaborating with your clients or your customers today. It is a discipline. It's something that we train our people uh, on on a regular basis. And it allows us to then uh, continue to drive a company that was born in 1886. Dr. John Pemberton, a pharmacist in Atlanta, Georgia, concocted a health tonic that was called Coca-Cola. And the first thing that he did was go to a customer called Jacob's Pharmacy in the fountain format. And today, last year in May, we celebrated our 125th anniversary as a, as a company. This is our chairman and CEO and president, Mutar Kent, who is a great leader. Uh, who has been with our company for decades. And we celebrate this great time having started with one brand and today serving $15 billion brands around the world, which we will probably double between now and 2020. Some of these brands you may know, some of these brands you may not know. You just mentioned Japan. So Kombucha is our successful tea brand in Japan. Georgia is our successful coffee brand also based in Japan. But we continue to be a brand company focused on building big world-class brands with and for our consumers. Today, as Linda said, we'll serve 1.7 billion consumers around the world in over 200 countries with over 300 bottling partners, 500 brands, 3,500 products, and a customer base of 20 million. And when we talk about customers, we're talking about the kind of picture you saw earlier a few minutes ago. So it's a, it's a big business. We're proud to have the most valuable brand in the world. And we know that that brand that's been built over 125 years can be attacked in 125 seconds in today's internet world. So we spend a lot of time making sure that we deliver against our brand promise, that we protect our brands, and that we recognize those are the crown jewels in our enterprise. Now, as we look toward 2020, I can tell you that we see a world that's tremendously different than what we've seen in the last decade. We know that there won't be one superpower. And we're now beginning to see that the BRIC countries that you've all heard about from emerging markets, some of those are growing and some of those are already beginning to see the challenges of growth. So when we think about our future growth, we're thinking about Indonesia, we're thinking about Vietnam, Colombia, many markets around the world that we're in today with tremendous growth potential. Obviously, China being a huge one. And when we look at the population, we know that by 2020, we'll be dealing with an 8 billion population with 20 trillion more dollars, which is the same of adding a, a metro LA every 70 plus days around the world. We're going to see this urbanization movement coming on. And that's one of the reasons why we're so bullish about the future. You hear all the time, whether you turn on the financial news, what's melting down this week and what's going sour and the euro and the, you know, the, the Deutsche Mark may or may not and the pound and the sterling and the blah, 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 blah. 
The reality is when we look toward 2020 and we think about the big picture, we're very excited about three mega trends. Number one, we're gonna see over 850 more million consumers that will be moving into urban markets, into larger villages, into small towns, townships. And this is going to bring with it a growth in the middle class of almost a billion people. Now, the, I can tell you the middle class is not Malibu. Uh, the middle class of the world, okay, you may read about this, but the middle class uh, around the world, really, uh, as the World Economic uh, Forum would, would define, uh, is people that now have electricity, or they have a, a different type of transportation than an animal. Uh, they have uh, pure water, perhaps, for the first time. So the world is coming on very fast. Uh, we want to be a part of that middle class expansion, and that's going to result in tremendous per capita income for these people. So you think about a country like Indonesia, which, which we think by 2020 will have around 400 million people. Today's per capita income, any guess of the per capita income in Indonesia today? 500. It's a little better than that. It's 2,300. But in the scheme of, uh, of, of what we might think of as uh, middle class, uh, very low. But think of that consumer with maybe $3,000. That brings them into our category, the non-alcoholic ready-to-drink category, because now they can actually afford maybe a drink a month or two drinks a month. And for a business that's operating on 1.7 billion servings a day, that's a big deal for us. Now, obviously, we, there's a lot of energy right now about the, uh, the consumer reset, and I won't go into great detail about that, but we are seeing a lot of consumer um, unrest around the world, uh, driven uh, by many different factions. Uh, you look at what's happened in, in Northern Africa in the last uh, few months, the revolution that really began in Tunisia, it's almost easy to forget about that, that moved all the way across through Egypt, uh, which has taken over Libya, et cetera, et cetera. But the reality is that we're seeing a fundamental consumer reset that's happening in America and around the world coming out of this recession and the world is still working through that. We see also a very sophisticated and engaged youth generation, which many of you are a part of. Very wired, five billion cell phones in the world today. Five billion, another half a billion will probably be bought this year. Uh, upwards to 40% of those are smartphones. So very well connected. And we need to be relevant to this youth. But at the same time, we're seeing an aging of the population um, as well. Facebook, Twitter, internet, totally connected. Very different types of social communities that we've got to learn to market with, to be a part of, and to allow that particular space not only to drive communities, but for us to be a part of that on new terms that a company like Coca-Cola isn't exactly, um, uh, hasn't built our brand on over the years. Not television advertising, but relations and conversations. I mentioned the aging uh, of the world. We look at Europe and we see an aging of the population. Uh, in Italy, for example, the oldest country in Europe, we've got to be more relevant to the over 40, over 50 population, which I'm very fond of that age group. <laughs> and you will be too someday. So um, as we think about that population, what's important to that, the, the uh, uh, aging of today is very different. The uh, expectancy of, of life stages is much longer. And so we need to be uh, very much uh, a part of that going forward. What does this really mean? It means that consumers are really in control, that they want their business, they want their brands, they want their beverages on the terms that they expect when they want them, where they want them, how they want them. So if we were in Mexico today, in Mexico City, going to a small uh, La Tienda where we have a, a, a relationship, a person will come in with a cell phone to pay for that Coke. And this is in a very unsophisticated outlet that's maybe you know, 40 square feet, 50 square feet, tiny little stop. That retailer has to be in position to accept that transaction over the cell phone because that 
consumer has no pesos. It's purely a cashless reality. In addition to that, we know that as the population grows and as the middle class grows, there will be a tremendous um, pressure on all kinds of commodities. You know, our business is very much a commodity uh, reliant business, whether it is sweeteners or whether it is fruit or whether it's aluminum or whether it is PET, our plastic that we put into our, our packaging. And so we need to be very much part of the solution and that's driving a very important sustainability agenda for all companies, Coca-Cola especially. Now when we look at it, we look at sustainability much bigger than just Mother Earth. We look at sustainable business, sustainable careers, sustainable communities. And so it's a very big part of our business going forward. About three years ago, our top bottlers and our executive leadership team stepped back. And we said, where do we want to be in 2020? And when you're in a franchised system like we are, alignment is so critical to move the entire enterprise forward. So we spent months building a 2020 vision, a mission to not only inspire the world, but to refresh the world through simple moments of optimism and happiness. And this 2020 vision uh, could not have been built without this important collaboration. And so any of you that are in a business that is franchised, or that you've been a part of a business that's franchised, you'll recognize how important it is to be aligned with the franchise community or the corporate office you know, will not be able to just dictate franchise actions and vice versa. And our, our plan really came together in these P's. People, portfolio, partners, planet, profitability, and productivity. And on one sheet of paper, we have our 2020 roadmap. Now, from a people perspective, we really know that it starts with being a great place to work. Wherever this is, with 206 countries to work with, we have a lot of interesting assignments, as you can imagine, all around the world. And we want to have the right kind of people with the right kind of engaging mindset to attract, engage, and retain the best people. And I think what you're doing here at Pepperdine is so important. The focus that you have, and I'll come back to that in just a few minutes. With a portfolio of 3,500 products and 500 brands, we have a great opportunity, but we also have a great challenge, which is how do we work with the simplicity of operations with our customers so that we can always be in stock, so that we can meet the needs of our consumers, but also make sure that we're playing to the big parts of the non-alcoholic beverage uh, landscape that we want to participate in. So we've set very clear goals around brand Coca-Cola. Coca-Cola is our core brand. It's the engine that pulls the train. When brand Coca-Cola is healthy, we have a great chance with the rest of our brands. When brand Coca-Cola is not healthy, we've got work to do on brand Coca-Cola. So what I would say to you is your core business can never be um, forgotten, no matter how young or how old you are. What is your core business? How well are you doing in your core business? And are you giving enough energy to your core business? Because it's very easy to get tantalized by the new shiny object. The newest product and the newest package and the newest flavor. But at the end of the day, core brand Coca-Cola is mission critical for us. At the same time, we know that consumers want juices, they want waters, they want energy drinks, they want isotonic beverages, they want coffees, they want teas, etc. And we plan to be a part of that, bringing innovation to market much faster. Our partners, which is the area of the company that I overlook worldwide, uh, is so important. Um, you know, right now we see the retail market all around the world going through different stages of development. And we want to be a part of helping our customers succeed, building joint plans with them, becoming a critical part of their growth strategies, and at the same time winning at the point of sale. So an example of this would be um, go back 18 months ago, um, maybe 24 months ago, I was in Europe with one of our top retail customers in the world with their CEO. And at that time, the early signs were coming forward 
that the um, recession was forthcoming. And this particular hypermarket company uh, sells a lot of durable goods. And so flat screen TVs, washing machines, dryers. If you've never been to a hypermarket in Europe, it's hard to imagine the footprint. But you've got everything from Coca-Cola to you know, um, flat screen TVs and everything that you would expect there. In a matter of weeks, that retailer's inventory went from about 12 to 14 days of stock to 12 months based on turn rates, which has huge balance sheet implications for a hundreds of billions of dollars uh, euros business. And so that really opened the door for us to collaborate to say, you know, how can we, uh, a, a product that moves thousands of times a day at pennies per transaction, help come forward with a new growth strategy to actually ex accelerate our category. Now the bigness of our 2020 vision is that we will actually double our business by 2020. Uh, and that's the most important thing to, to communicate. We will go from 1.7 billion servings a day to almost 3 billion. Uh, we will do in 10 years what's taken our company 125 years to accomplish. Uh, not for the faint of heart, um, but I can assure you that our plans uh, are on track since we announced our 2020 vision. We've had six consecutive quarters of hitting our long-term growth aspirations. And the way to do this is to collaborate even deeper with all partners and build those relationships to capture more occasions of use um, for our beverages. The planet becomes a huge part of our focus. Uh, given the reliance on water, Coca-Cola has chosen to be very focused on water conservation. We expect to be, by 2020, water neutral, which means for every liter of beverage that we produce, we will actually return a liter to the environment. It's a very bold ambition when you're doubling the business. But we know that in many parts of sub-Saharan Africa, uh, in the US, we're seeing drought conditions and water tables are a big issue. Same thing in India, many of our emerging markets. And so uh, as we look at winning with our community, we are focused on how we do that in, in water and many other areas. Now, profitability, listen, we are a, a publicly traded company. Our share owners expect a fair return for their investments, and so we're not bashful that we are here to grow our profitability. Our key to growing profitability will be growing our top line through incremental volume, and then marginally growing our operating margin on those cases, because it's a big turn business. Now, the way that we will do that is also in conjunction with productivity. So our company is very focused on um, squeezing out non-productive investments, non-productive overhead, non-productive cost. Uh, we announced a $500 million transformation target to bring our cost down uh, a little over two years ago, and we're actually ahead of schedule to do that by the end of this year, uh, by the end of last year. So we're, we are uh, becoming much more ingrained in operational effectiveness, in supply chain efficiencies, in all kinds of areas of our huge business where you know, a penny here and a penny there adds up to billions. Now, the reality is that this entire 2020 vision is based on continuing to build great brands, to continue to have great occasions where our brands are enjoyed billions of times a day at cents per transaction. And that leads me to just a quick kind of conversation about brands. Um, you know, a brand is a very interesting thing to think about. And no matter what business you're in today, no matter what service you're involved in, whether you're a professor, whether you are a student, whether you are employed, an entrepreneur or whatever, you're dealing with a branded situation. Now when we think about a brand like Zappos, which is a brand I bet many of you are aware of. How many here know Zappos? Okay, I see a lot of women in the crowd <laughs> that know Zappos and a lot of neoclassical men too. The um, Tony Shea is a fabulous example, I think, of a story that completely redesigned this industry. Now, if you had said that an uh, IT guy from Harvard was going to go in and reposition the shoe business, you would say, wow, that sounds pretty exciting. 
No, you wouldn't. You would say, That's, you've got to be kidding me. But what's the most interesting thing about this particular story, what is the promise that Zappos makes to all of you? We'll get there in a minute. Hold that thought. Um, other, what is the promise that Zappos makes? Return? Satisfaction? Have you ever tried on the shoes with Zappos? No. You probably tried them on somewhere else. What's interesting about this is a, a, a category that's all about fit for men anyway. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'm not sure about some of the other shoes that I see. Um, fit and fashion. It's interesting that Tony Shea built a company that is servicing shoes through long distance, through fabulous customer service, through virtually no advertising, and has changed the game on Zappos. The hook is he decided not to outsource his core competency. And his core competency, he would tell you today, was supply chain logistics. And in the early phases of Zappos, he did that, and the company almost went under. And then he came in, took it over. One thing led to another. And this company was sold to whom? Amazon. For how much? $1.2 billion later, Tony's happy. <laughs> now, what I love about this is that this is a simple, smart guy who saw a gap in the market, who developed a unique promise, who delivers against that promise, and has a great relationship with their customers. A lot of these long-distance 1-800 order-by-phone companies rate their people on minutes per phone conversation. So their metric is how, long, how can you get fewer minutes per customer? Tony Shea doesn't measure that. He wants every customer to be happy. The record today is a nine-hour conversation with one customer. She was looking for a special pair of boots. And they kept, they worked through it for nine hours. They're looking at the movies, the places, the online, the YouTubes, everything. I love this as a great story about branding. You're lucky to have another one. A cult brand, In-N-Out Burger. You don't need to hear about In-N-Out Burger, a great customer of ours, by the way. But a company that once again has redefined the burger business. In a in the most competitive hamburger business in the world, California, where you have McDonald's, Burger King, Wendy's, In-N-Out, Carl's Jr., Jack in the Box, Tommy Burgers, Fat Burgers, Johnny Rockets, Ruby's, I could go on. <laughs> we know these people. All right, another thing that great brands uh, understand and know is that they need to focus and excel. And they don't try to be all things to all people. Why do I love Mini Cooper? Who here has a Mini Cooper? Okay. How, how, tell me about your experience. Do you love your Mini Cooper? I do. What's your Mini Cooper's name? No. James. <laughs> James. <laughs> I knew it. How is James today? He's doing very well. James is very well. What do your friends say about this Mini Cooper? They, all love, it. they love it. Look at you. You are <laughs> serious, such a sweet. <laughs> You and James, you got a thing going on. How much of the market does Mini Cooper walk away from every day? Every morning when that dealership opens up, pick a number like 90, 95. If you're a truck buyer, a van buyer, a sedan buyer, ba 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 ba. 99.9, whatever. It's a, they walk away from, talk about focus and sacrifice. Standing room around the dealership still to get these cars. Cult success. What happens when you and James pass another Mini Cooper in traffic? What do you do? Tell us the truth. Oh, um, I, I, I James, but don't get <laughs> She's having fun with other Mini Coopers. These are people that are fanatics. They don't know each other, but they know each other. 
strong brand based on focus and sacrifice, which means they know their target audience. And we'll come to why that's so important to you as people in just a couple of minutes. What is your name? Nivi. Nivi. Okay, you and James are going to have a great future, I can tell. <laughs> um, one interesting thing about brands is that everything communicates. Everything communicates. Okay? I came to this hotel. I checked into this hotel. I work for Coke. I've been with Coke for 23 years. What was the second thing I did after getting in my room? <laughs> Got to look around here, Linda. Got to make sure we're in the right hotel. <laughs> Linda did her homework. Had a great Diet Coke. <laughs> that could have been high drama. <laughs> but the reality is that everything communicates. Everything communicates. You can be spending a million dollars on your company's ad campaign, have a bad operator, have a bad person answer the phone. You can be in the medical services business with the best doctors, have a crummy parking lot a mile away with a shuttle service to get to that great doctor. Everything communicates. And we see, we have learned over the years. 1985, we kind of did this thing called New Coke. Many of you have read about it. Some of you are here. What we learned is that the consumers own Coca-Cola. We don't. And the mistake that we made with all of the great research that we did, and it was the most researched move you can imagine, we failed to ask you what would happen if that left, if you couldn't get that anymore. Well, we heard quickly from you, and it was back in record time, okay? So, now there are times where that everything communicates goes awry. And here we have an example where everything does communicate. And here's a guy that went from that to whatever in a matter of days. People, confusion, branding, right? Everything communicates. And I, I want you to think about that because um, as a Successful brand, we are always looking at that, our packaging, our messaging, our, um, our media. Successful brands also need to lead with authenticity and passion. Be true to yourself. Now, what does Tom's Shoes do? Hello, you were ahead of the class a few minutes ago. The fact is, Blake Mykoski, who knows the story of Blake? You've got to know this story. So what happened here? He was windsurfing in Argentina and he saw a bunch of kids didn't have shoes, so he came back and rustled up all his friends and then it couldn't be on the wildest dreams to start a company. And what were happening to those kids with no shoes? Foot problems. Foot problems. Very bad foot problems. Very bad foot problems. That could be solved by what? The the Getting the foot off the ground through a shoe. Here's an interesting commercial model founded on a passion that he saw while he was in Argentina where for every pair of shoes he sells, he donates a pair of shoes to children in need. In this room is a Blake Mykowski. In this room is a Tony Shea. In this room is someone with passion like you have for James. And the question is, how will you bring that passion to life? Here's another example of a person with passion. Who knows Stephanie Joanne Angelina Germanata? <laughs> the most decorated success story in Billboard today. How much of the market does she walk away from every morning? A lot. But she's true to herself. You may not like her. You may not value the way she lives her life, and she would say to you kindly, you're not my target audience. But to her little monsters, they love Lady Gaga. They love what she stands for. They love what she means. Bono, another example of a person who would consider himself, as he would say, a self-admitted average singer from Ireland. I would disagree with that, but 
That's how he would describe himself. What is it about a guy like Bono that suddenly takes him beyond just a singer into a world mover? It's passion. It's purpose. It's, it's humanitarianism. Why would this guy have a voice with this group? Because he can connect and touch, connect with and touch people through an authentic approach to help make the world a better place. I love these brands. Now, this leads me to the question, you know, what if you as an individual thought of yourself as a brand? Would you be doing what you're doing? Would you be living the life you're leading today? Would you be doing something different? How would you position yourself? Which led to this idea a few years ago of 30 plus years of consumer branding with a person that's committed to people development that said, could we indeed put some of the precepts of consumer branding to work for us as individuals to brand ourselves in order to lead our most successful life, to create our most successful self. Notice the book doesn't say managing brand use seven steps to getting a better job, seven steps to whatever. It's about finding who you are inside. And that's really what drove me to, while I was working, actually write a book with my co-author. And what's interesting about this idea is that if you think this is about getting on a treadmill and doing a weight loss program and going to a makeover, that's not what this is about. This idea is grounded on being true to yourself, being authentic, and bringing out that gift inside of you that makes you a unique and differentiated brand. It's grounded on this idea, a simple idea of what if you were to unleash the power of brand you? And whatever that means, doesn't mean you have to be CEO of your company or head of your class or any of that. It means, you know, what is it about you that is different, that's unique, that can make a difference? You might want to just take a little risk. You might want to actually reinvent. Whatever it is, the book is designed to help you go through a process on your own terms and determine what makes you special. It's really put together in two sections. One is a bit of a self-discovery, which is exactly what a brand would do, which is an audit, a SWOT analysis on what is happening today. The difference with people, though, is that this is a chronology of your experiences life to date. Because we are shaped and we interact with others based on the life we've led to this point. So I gave a speech a few years ago on this topic, and a woman came up to me at the end of this uh, speech. It was before the book was published. And she said, Jerry, I'm so glad I came. I, I now know what my issue is. I said, wow, that's amazing. What is it? She said, you know, I didn't make cheerleader in high school. <laughs> I said, wow, tell me about it. She said, well, I'm 51 years old. And I remember that week like it was yesterday. I showed up on Monday. I was there early. I stayed late. I picked up the pom-poms, the megaphones. I was the first one there every day. Worked the hardest. Nailed the tryout. Knew every cheer inside and out. When the selections were made, a more popular girl was chosen. Ever since that moment in her life, people, that's decades. Guess what her bias was about any of you she met? Well, if you're popular, I don't like you. Even if you do know James, I don't like you. And, and it's interesting because we all have our cheerleader events, don't we? We didn't get into the club, we didn't whatever. But how many of those are anchors on your brand boat today? that are holding you back, and this woman, merely by identifying it and saying, I'm, that's ridiculous, I'm going to get rid of it, she turned into a different person. Now, this audit step is important. You then go into, uh, and that could take weeks to do, but you really go through the five life stages 
uh, up to your um, to understand your audit. Um, the first four stages come very fast, and the fifth stage starts at age 30 and goes to 100. And the reason for that is that once you hit around 30-ish, you know you you kind of are a function of how well you deal with what life throws you now. And how well do you adapt? There was a study done many years ago on successful leaders. And the question was, what makes leaders successful? The theory was that it was education, that it was networks, that it was uh, um, you know, being in the right kind of upbringing, all, of, all kinds of things. The only common thread between successful leaders is that they all had come back from defeat. They had had something happen in their career that was a setback, and they figured out a way to come back from that. So this audit allows you to think about the good, the bad, and the ugly, to leverage where you are, and to start thinking about how that inventory, that audit, positions you to differentiate yourself going forward. The image is basically the perception that others have of you today, which is an important step, just to know how people see you, which then equips you to start the next five steps of creating an identity that you want to stand for, then positioning yourself in a unique space that, that differentiates you uh, on your own authenticity. Then you set goals, 10-year goals. Where do you want to be in a decade? And then plan back from that. You don't have to have the job defined, but what kind of life do you want to be leading a decade from now? And if you think about this in a 10-year window, it's unbelievable the number of actions you can take to change your life. If you think in increments of a year, the clock's always you know, nipping at your heels. Once those goals are set, then set a strategy. Great strategists know how to understand strategic options before they decide on one. I'm sure you're learning that in this curriculum. Don't marry the first strategy on your goals but work toward finding the optimal strategy to meet your goals. And then clearly the implementation phase is so important. So here's something you can take away today. No matter who you are or what you're doing, all of you in this room have a job description. You may be a student, you may be an entrepreneur, you may be a professor. But that job description gives you the specifications for your job. And it helps you to understand what is expected of you. But very few people differentiate themselves in their current jobs. They spend most of their time trying to get promoted. What's the next job? What's the next job? Let me look at the posting board. How can I move up? Instead of differentiating themselves where they are today. So let's look at a job at Coca-Cola. There's a job that would be a customer operations manager that would work with chain accounts, chain customers that have more than five outlets. And this is what we would expect them to know. Supply chain, beverage quality, equipment, pretty straightforward stuff, right? Let's look at two people that position themselves. John, on the left, positions to my manager. I am meeting the job requirements that deliver the department's goals because of my annual performance review. That's how John is positioned in his job today. Look at Jane. Same job, same grade, same pay, same you know, compensation. To my customers, I am their chief operations officer who delivers innovative beverage solutions proactively, which has resulted in Coca-Cola being named supplier of the year. These are two people in the same job, the same spec. HR would see them as you know, job number X or 12 and job number 14. Now, who's going to be positioned to win? Clearly, Jane. Target audience for John's positioning statement, and this is what the, the actual process takes you through. You actually would write positioning statements for your target audience. John's got one person, his manager. Everything's riding on how, you know, you need some coffee? Faye, can I get you, you're my manager? How about a cup of coffee? How about, you know, can I, can I help with the kids this week? Whatever, right? Meeting the job requirements, what is the proof point? One review at the end of the year, which includes two letters. And that's the rating. So everything is about the manager and the rating, whereas Jane has positioned herself to her entire customer base 
and the proof point is that Coke is named Supplier of the Year. I submit to you, leaving here today, leaving here this evening, think about your job description. How many of you here are students? How many of you are full-time students? Okay. How many of you think you have a job description? Right? So realize that if you're a student and you're coming in and your positioning is that you are five minutes late every day and you're unprepared for that lecture and you're called on and you have nothing of substance to offer, don't come up and wonder why you're not getting the next choice assignments or the opportunities. Obviously, you're not there because you're here tonight. But think about this job and how you are positioning yourself in the context of Pepperdine. Now, what I love about what's happening here is that what's happening here under Linda and the team's leadership is exactly what the corporate and entrepreneurial world needs more than ever. And I'm not just saying that because you invited me to speak. We need more value-based people in industry. Because as you start doing business around the world, I can tell you the rules get very quickly very fuzzy. You know, what is considered normal practice in a developed market is not normal practice in an emerging market. You know, doing business in China, welcome to a whole other sphere of opportunities. But if you are grounded in the right values, you'll never find yourself in a compromising position. Now, you may have some sales challenges here and there, but that can be overcome. A value break is something that lives on. So learning that early on and learning that in an institution that's committed to that uh, is, I think, extraordinary. Student focused. If you're a student, think about what that means to you. Think about the commitment that this institution has just made to you. And if you're a student, the, the R, the responsibility just went up on you. That means you need to be ready to receive. And you need to be a fertile ground for all of this investment that's coming right at you. Okay? And experience driven, when I look for people to hire into my organization, I look for people that have real world experience. And what you're doing with the E to B is an example of that type of leadership. When I can look at someone that's actually been in education and has then taken a multi-week assignment to solve a real critical problem for a real company with real share owners, with real deliverables, I'm more interested in you than the social chair of the Pi Kappa whatever. Not that there's anything wrong with the Pi Kappa whatever. But I can tell you that is a differentiator. When you then cut one small double click down from there, and you begin to see the social responsibility and that you've heard me talk about collaboration, how critical collaboration is in today's world. The fact is, global reality is right here in California. Look around this room. The world is in this room. So we are already living in a global ecosystem. And you've got to have that kind of sensitivity and skills and knowledge not only about mores and norms and social values, but also how to work with and how to communicate with different types of cultures. And that's why I'm so excited about being here tonight. I'm convinced that if you use this Pepperdine experience, you can begin to start saying to yourself, what is your 2020 vision? And where do you want to be in 2020? What is your aspiration? Think of yourself as a brand. How would you want your brand talked about by your target audience? Because it'll be here, as I say, in only 95 months. It's coming. It's coming fast. We're already in 2012, people. 
It just seems like yesterday when it was the, you know, Y2K. Remember that? Big thing? Okay. So that's really what I wanted to talk about. Uh, it's, it's a true honor to be here tonight. Uh, I wanted to share just a few minutes with you where we're going as a company, why we're so bullish about the future, why we are so excited about the macro trends in spite of what you see on today's TV, a little bit about great brands, some of the people that I admire in branding, and then perhaps a way to, for you to think about yourself as a brand. So hopefully that's been useful. Uh, I want to thank you, and uh, it's a real honor to be here tonight, Dean.